Hey everyone, we're back at the piano with Chopin Fantasy Impromptu Part 3. And we're going to look at the middle section this time. This. So this is where we're at. We're just going to go right into this section today. And I'll start by saying that there's many, many, many different ways of playing this. And this is the thing about Chopin. You have a kind of freedom to, to do different things. And it's never so, it's never the sort of thing that you decide that it's going to be exactly like this and you play that way. Sort of like you would do maybe with Beethoven probably a lot. But Chopin, it's just not like that. You have to give the space to be able to do whatever feels right in the moment. That's, that's something that goes very well with this music. So now it needs that freedom, but it also needs a general structure. So the first thing we can look at in this is that it repeats a lot of times and we're going to have to come up with a strategy so that it's not always the same. So let's start right uh, where we maybe go into this. Just kind of play with the sound that you have, whatever it was from here. Then you have four For some reason, to me, this tempo seems really right. I think in the past I would have played it a lot faster, but I, you, you have to go with what feels right to you. But if you want to take time, oh, please do take time in this section because it's, it's just really nice like this. like it's written with the accents. You could do the top one time, since this repeats three times. So you would have... Maybe once, although he didn't write it that way. Another possibility that I like to do at some point, maybe in the pianissimo part, when you do it very soft, or somewhere else, Instead of ac accenting the melodic note, which is the first of the triplets in the left hand, G, F, E, so we have, you can do, so you're 
bringing out the second one. So you have this instead of this. It's just a possibility to make things different. Okay, we keep going. Most, the most everything's important, is to shape the right hand G. So from the E to the F, I do the F a little louder than the E, and then down. Now this kind of picks it back up. Sorry. You have sometimes notes in the left hand as well. So not that much, but you could just show them sometimes. And you can practice them so that when you feel like doing it, it'll naturally come out. So what I would probably do is a little bit of the D here, the D flat, and then a little bit more of the D natural. two videos on this middle section. One to just do the beginning and then one to show the whole structure of the whole entire section. So we have first bar, crescendo to here, and then to here. Now come to the F and down. And this makes it continue. as if we're finished and we're here in our D major, D flat major. It sounds like a perfect cadence that this is the cadence that ends the phrase. End of phrase, but oh no, it's not. It's a half cadence. We finish on the dominant. So you have to show that some way here. A little bit softer. So this is maybe my personal interpretation, which is not written in the score. I would slow down, or you can do it differently each time, right? But at least once, and this is how I like the first time, is to take a bit more time in this thing. Then I would pick up back the tempo, so I would do the, the ritenuto not where it's written. And now this is the thing that, that, how can you not do what the composer wrote? Well, this is a little different, I would say, with Chopin than with Beethoven, because Beethoven is extremely specific and very, he um, was known to complain about the way pe that people didn't follow exactly what he had written in the score. Chopin was the total opposite. Chopin would play uh, a mazurka twice at the beginning of a concert and at the end. And the first uh, first time he would play it, it would be really like a mazurka, like 
kind of fast and like a dance. And at the end of the concert, he would play it again in a completely different tempo, very slow. It was almost like a nocturne and people wouldn't recognize the piece. So he was more of an improviser, Chappé, than a composer. He's, he was best at improvising and Liszt said about him that he would write one thing in the score and play something completely different, completely opposite. So if it feels better to you to do a ricinuto here and then pick it up, and it helps bring out the overall structure, then you have to do it. Because that's, that's really Chopin. It's not to, to be uh, very meticulous about where he wrote what in the score, because it can be actually very confusing what he writes. So... <laughs> too in the bottom. So I'm just thinking about this now because there's a crescendo written here and thinking about how confusing it is what he writes in the score. Sometimes he, there's a crescendo written and it, it's uh, pertaining to a particular voice and not the entire thing. So that's something you can just be, be aware of. So that's how I would do this. And then this, you have to shape as well the ornaments. Try to make it go ya da -dee da -dee. There's even two curves in here, right? We have three notes going up and then this. But if that's too much, just do one thing. Ya -da 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 -dee. And the little notes should be less loud than the actual note, which is this one. So it goes something like this. slowing down may not be the best and I will find by listening to this video probably that that some places that either it's okay or not so you have to experiment also and try to be with not slowing down and this also the question is if we do it on as as a as a triplet or as because in a lot of Chopin's music, when the left hand is doing this, the right hand will actually follow. However, 
I'm I'm not the expert to answer that question. I would have to uh, find an expert, but it sounds better to me. So I would do especially since the general rhythmic theme of this piece in both of these sections is uh, three against two. So that would kind of keep it. Pardon me. section. 